before going straight to the um, title of the class, as you know, food sovereignty is very important. It's the right of people to healthy and culturally uh, food produced through ecologically sound and sustainable methods and the rights to define their own food and agricultural system. In our region, the Swana region, this has been subject to colonialism and to exploitation. And this has placed our food sovereignty at stake as the impact of colonialism and the impact of the current neo-colonialism and exploitation system. However, there is a way, there is a way to counter the impacts of colonialism to actually turn the impacts of neo-colonialism and exploitation and go back to what we've named at Slow Factory, our green roots, our indigenous agriculture in the Swana or in the Middle East. Agriculture, as uh, some of you know, or the majority of you know, emerged in the Swana in the Middle East first 12,000 years ago crops, skills, and ancestral knowledge have been passed down through generations to us. However, this indigenous agriculture was disrupted, dislodged, to the profit of colonial production or simply destroyed. This is a short history of our green roots in the Swana in the Middle East. The class or the presentation is divided into five big topics with two very interesting, uh, uh, let's say, cultural uh, 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 insights. I'm going to be talking first about the dawn of agriculture, how and when did it start. I'm going to talk about the founder crops, some of which are still present, are still crucial to the Swana food culture and are now even part of the global food culture. I'm going to talk about what we call, as historians, the Arab medieval agricultural revolution that gave humanity uh, crops and products that are still present in, uh, in our daily lives. I'm going to also be going back to the first cookbooks in the history of humanity that were produced in what was medieval Baghdad, the biggest city back then in the world. And five, I'm going to be talking about indigenous agriculture versus colonial agriculture. And I will take Lebanon as a case study of how colonial agriculture destroyed indigenous agriculture and even led to the death of 40% of the Lebanese population in World War I. So, I invite you on a very, very interesting journey. And let's go back first to the beginnings, 12,000 years ago. This is the dawn of agriculture. The beginning of agriculture about 12,000 years ago in the Neolithic Middle East was a crucial event in human history. For those of you who don't know, pre uh, historians, we love to divide uh, periods. Divide prehistory into, um, especially when we are talking about human activity, into two big uh, uh, periods, what we call Paleolithos, Paleolithic, or Neolithos, Neolithic. Well, we also have another passion as historians. We love to take uh, 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 concepts and words from the Greek or Latin language. Paleo in Greek means old, and lithos, stone, so the period of the old stone. This is when our ancestors started producing stone tools to hunt and to use in their daily lives, but in a way they were roughly cutting the stones. Then in period number two, neo lithos, neo is new, lithos stone, they started cutting specialized stones, flint stones. This is where you get the famous American uh, series from the 60s, the flint stones, to use in a new context, in the context of agriculture. And agriculture emerged during this period, especially in the Swana in the Middle East. And this changed the history of humanity forever. And we are still living in the consequences of this Neolithic period. 
Agriculture so began in the Neolithic era when the last ice age ended. Of course, this is not the subject for today's topic, but just keep in mind that chronologically, the end of the last ice age in the Swarma region coincided with the emergence of agriculture. Before the emergence of agriculture, our ancestors either hunted or foraged for food. So the birth of agriculture is referred to as the Neolithic revolution because it completely changed the way humans were organized and it even led later on to the emergence of the first villages then towns, then city-states, then states, then empires in the Swana region. The birth of agriculture is often referred to as the Neolithic Revolution, as it seems to coincide with this period, the period of the New Stone Age, the Neolithic. Very important concepts to keep in mind. The Middle East, or Swana, is one of the places where agriculture first emerged, and many historians do think that it was the place where it first emerged. This is a reconstruction of a house in a Neolithic village. There is a magnificent archaeological site in present-day Turkey called Çatal Huyuk. In Çatal Huyuk is where archaeologists found one of the biggest and best preserved Neolithic villages. We're talking about a village that is 8,000 years old. This is where archeologists were able to actually give us the data that I explained and to elaborate more on how agriculture worked in the Neolithic, what were they eating? And this is what we will see in the second uh, part of the presentation. How were they building their houses? This led to the emergence of architecture. And I want to pinpoint two important things in this picture. See this little oven? This is the ancestor of all ovens in the world. And it comes from the Middle East, from the Swana. We call it, and we still call it, tanur. Tanur denotes an oval or a round shape. Our oldest kind of bread is called tanur. We also do produce other kinds of bread, some of whom are the descendants of the Neolithic kind of bread, especially the Tanur. If you get the chance to visit Lebanon, this is one of, or Palestine, or Syria, or Turkey, or Jordan, or Iraq, or Egypt, this is one of the bread that you will be eating, and you will be eating a bread that is 8,000 years old. What were they eating? And what were they planting? What was agriculture back then? What is very important to keep in mind is that the Swana region or the Middle East is the original region, the native region of what we in history call the founder crops. Crops that were crucial in the development of human agriculture and crops that are still very important in the Swana and globally. The Neolithic founder crops as a concept are eight plant species. So we're talking about eight plant species that were first domesticated. As you know, agriculture, the Neolithic revolution, the emergence of uh, agriculture also was at the same time a period where humans developed pastoralism because they domesticated wild muttons and wild goats, and they also domesticated plants. Between, and this, this process of domestication took at least 3,000 years. So the Neolithic founder crops are eight plant species that were first domesticated by early farming communities in the Middle East. How we, do, how, how we know that, we found the grains either in 
the Neolithic site of Çatalhöyük in present-day Turkey, or in many archaeological sites in Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, Palestine, and you would be amazed that many of you actually are eating some of these founder crops. Why am I talking about the founder crops? In the context of regaining our indigenous agriculture and acquiring our food sovereignty, it is very important to go back to what our ancestors actually planted and produced. So let's start. The eight founder crops are indigenous to the Middle East, to the Swana region. They are from our region. First, flax. I've added also the Latin botanical name for those of you who would like to uh, 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 read further about. Linum usitatissimum. Evidence of oil seed flax domestication dates back to around 9,000 years to Syria. So this plant was very important because not only it gave us grains, but also flax or linen was used to produce clothing. And one of the oldest clothing material in the region were linen, was linen. This is number one. Number two, bitter vetch, vikia ervilia or kersenne in Arabic. It is something that slightly disappeared from our food uh, rather recently in the, in the 19th century in, 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 in Lebanon and, and Syria and Palestine and Jordan. This plant was also first grown about 9,500 years ago around the Middle East. And we found in many archeological sites the, um, the, the remains of the grains of this plant. It might have been used to feed the cattle. Chickpea, Caesar aritia, or hummus. I think that many of you already had the chance to taste the many varieties of hummus. So hummus is not just this uh, dip in the West. Uh, I'm using this for uh, an easier, flow of information, it is used as a dip. But in the Middle East, it is a dish. And it has many, many varieties. Chickpeas are among the earliest legumes to be cultivated as evidence of 7,500 years old remain have been identified in the Middle East. This is very important because hummus, as we call it, is still one of the basic uh, uh, ingredients of Middle Eastern music, um, cuisine and Arabic cuisine. The modern version of the hummus that is globally famous was developed in between Baghdad, Damascus, and Beirut. And the earliest evidence of this present day recipe, we have recipes that date back to 4,000 years ago from Mesopotamia, but the earliest evidence of mixing this hummus paste tahina goes back to, uh, to the ninth, uh, uh, to Baghdad in the 9th, 10th, and then 12th century. So it's very important to keep in mind that this comes from our region. Number four, P, P sum sativum. Uh, the earliest archeological findings date back to the Neolithic era and present day countries of Greece, Syria, Turkey, and Jordan, where we found the, the remains of these peas. And it's very important to know that colonialism actually introduced new species of uh, 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 peas that kind of disrupted this indigenous native. But now it's, and that's very good because of the crisis, especially in Lebanon, it's coming back. Number five, lentils, lens culinaris, or what we call in Arabic, adas. Evidence indicates that lentils were consumed at around 9,000 to 30,000 years ago in the Middle East. An insight, the Roman army uh, diet for a soldier included eating lentils several times a week because it's an excellent source of nutrition. It is still 
to this day a very important ingredient in Arabic and Swanna cuisine. And it's also an indigenous plant. Number six, barley, Hordum vulgare. Barley was among the first grains to be grown in Eurasia about 10,000 years ago, and it is one of the main crops of this agricultural revolution in the Swanna. It was used by humans, and also it was used to feed the cattle. Seven, ain corn wheat. Uh, you need to keep in mind that ain corn in German means single grain. The domestication of the crop dates back between 10,600 years ago and 9,900 years ago in the region that is now between modern present-day Syria and Turkey, and even in some archaeological sites in Lebanon. So also one of the earliest plants to be domesticated is indigenous to the Swana region. Eight, emmer wheat. Uh, emmer wheat first grew uh, 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 in, in the area, and it was collected by hunters and gatherers in the Swanna region for thousands of years. Then, I give you an insight, they started actually roasting the grains and eating them. Then they discovered that if they crush the grains using a stone, they will have flour. And if they mix the flour with water and actually grill it, they will have bread. And bread was a very uh, important source of nutrition to our ancestors. And also on their long, long hunting trips, it was very easy to carry bread. And so it's very important to understand the process of how bread emerged. Number nine. So these are, I'm, I'm sorry, the eight, the eight crops are indigenous to our region. They are still present in our region. They are actually uh, 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 in danger of being replaced by non-indigenous crops in the Middle East that only serve the global co companies and would put our food sovereignty at stake. Indigenous agriculture in the Middle East, such as in the Beka Valley or Plain, this is the Beka Valley. The, uh, uh, the picture is in the Beka. Uh, uh, the Beka Valley, Lebanon is actually two mountain ranges. It looks a bit like California, but on a very uh, uh, smaller scale. And you have a very fertile plain, the plain of the Beka, that was at the heart of what uh, older historians would call the uh, Fertile Crescent, the area that is around major rivers in what we call the Middle East, the Tigris, the Euphrates, the uh, uh, Orontos, the Litani, the Jordan, and the Nile Valley, where this indigenous agriculture first emerged. However, this indigenous agriculture was disrupted, dislodged, and destroyed in some areas by Western European colonialism. Many parts of the Beka in Lebanon are actually now drier than ever because of exploiting it to plant things that would actually serve colonial interests. And this is something we'll see in the last part. I also wanted you to see how beautiful this valley is. And just keep in mind, the Mount, this is one of the most important mountains in the Middle East, it, Jabal al-Sheikh or Mount Haramun. Three, the Arab medieval agricultural revolution. So timeline, now I'm gonna be talking about a process that started in the late seventh century and continued until the late 13th century. What is the Arab agricultural revolution? The illustration you see is taken from the many agricultural and nutrition manuals that were produced in the medieval Arab world. You, you have to keep in mind that producing books in the medieval Arab world was a very intense activity because the Arabs were able, after the Battle of Talas, in the early 8th century, 
to take from the Chinese the uh, know-how of how to produce cheaper paper. Europe back then, or Western Europe, was still using parchment and was still, uh, 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 so paper was extremely, extremely expensive in Western Europe. In the Arab Muslim world, paper was produced on large scale, it was cheaper, and this contributed to making actually the Arab world more educated. And literacy rates in the Arab world were way higher in the Middle Ages than literacy rates in Western Europe. What is the Arab agricultural revolution? And why am I talking about a revolution, a change of the situation? It is a massive influx of crops that quickly became vital to life, expanded the farmed landscape and replaced inferior foodstuffs and altered the Middle East and Mediterranean drastically. So keep in mind that it had far-reaching consequences affecting not only agricultural production and income, but also population levels, urban growth, the distribution of the labor force, linked industries, cooking and diet, clothing, and other spheres of life. But what was it? So why was it possible in what we call the Arab Muslim world? Following the mid seventh century collapse of Byzantine authority in the East and Mediterranean and the demise of Sasanian Persia, keep in mind that prior to the Arab Muslim conquest, the two main powers around the Mediterranean and in a large part of the Swanna were the Eastern Roman Empire. And because we historians, we love to give weird names to empires. We call them currently the Byzantines. However, they referred to themselves as Eastern Romans. And the Sasanians, the last dynasty of uh, emperors in uh, uh, Persia and antiquity, they both collapsed facing the Arab Muslim expansion. Well, the reasons of the collapse are usually not explained in the uh, 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 in, the, uh, uh, in the narrative. The narrative says that the Arab Muslim conquest was a violent conquest and it was a bloody conquest. However, historical sources paint a different image. These empires first fought for like 20 years, so they were already weakened. And this period coincided with what we call the Justinian plague, one of the first pandemics that killed 40% of the population of the Byzantine Empire. So resistance to the newly uh, expanding empire was minimal. And for the first time, when the Arab Muslim uh, uh, Empire was established, for the first time since the Roman Empire, large, large section of the Mediterranean, of the Swanna region, were unified from Afghanistan Till Spain under one authority. The map you see on the slide is the famous map made by an Arab Muslim geographer, Al Idrisi. You can Google him and you can find that back then uh, uh, there wasn't really this Euro centered uh, 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 cartography. And just I wanted you to see that to get a sense of how developed the civilization was. So this unity, and this is very important to understand the Arab agricultural revolution, this unity, so a large territory that had a single cult uh, language for culture, kind of a single political authority, this unity facilitated communication and trade and created an atmosphere that encouraged the spread of knowledge and goods. Further, the Arabs' own familiarity with farming so you... 70 food crop and one fiber crop that became important over a large area of the Mediterranean, Mediterranean world were introduced during this Arab agricultural revolution. Let me give you an idea of what products are they. So rice, sugarcane, banana, lemon, lime, hide, hard durum wheat, and sorghum were all introduced on a very large scale during the Arab agricultural revolution. Other also products 
less important, but familiar and significant to our diet and to the global diet also. Watermelon, eggplant, spinach, artichoke, colocasia, sour orange, shaddock, mango, coconut palm were all brought by the Arab Muslim empire and transformed into global products. Also, planting these on a very large scale helped actually rise the, uh, 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 the population levels and the life expectancy because people under Arab Muslim rule were eating very good food, had better lives. Eventually, during the era of European expansion and colonization of the New World, a number of these crops were taken by the European and became major components of what uh, 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 European-centered colonialism calls the Colombian exchange, which was a catastrophe, and then passed into global agriculture and industry. I need to add one more uh, uh, element to this revolution. However, this is something that goes back to the 14th and 15th century, and it was largely popularized by the Ottomans, it's coffee. Coffee was transformed into a global product and a product that is present in our day-to-day -day life. First in Ethiopia, second in, Yemen, third in what is now present-day Syria and Lebanon, and fourth, in the Ottoman Empire and through the Ottoman Empire, it went to Western Europe and from Western Europe, it went to the new world. So whenever you're drinking coffee, think of its Arab roots. Chief among the crops are ubiquitous and fundamental new world plant crops like sugarcane, banana, and rice, all that were popularized by this Arabic agricultural revolution. Not only they actually popularized the crop, but they produced scholarship around these crops. At the court of the early Abbasid caliphs, the Abbasid were a dynasty of Arab Muslim rulers based between 750 and 1258 in Baghdad. The manuscripts in this court of Abbasid Baghdad from all over the world were collected. And as these could be read only by scholars, the translation of books from Greek, Persian, Syriac, and Sanskrit was actively promoted over a century. And this is because the Abbasid uh, empire was a very diverse uh, state. The Christians that lived under Arab rule, who were fluent both in Arabic, Syriac, and Greek, were the main translators. And they actually played the role of transmitters of knowledge from antiquity, the knowledge of the Greek, Romans, Persians, and Indians to a new set of uh, knowledge developed in the Arab Muslim world. Among the books so translated were many works on agriculture, botany, and pharmacology, all of which helped make Arabs familiar with plants they had not seen. And many agricultural uh, uh, manuals, I'm sharing some of the uh, 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 slides, uh, the illustrations from these manuals, survive from this period. We have a book called Kitab al-Nabat. Kitab in Arabic means book. Al-Nabat, a plan, by Abu Hanifa Dinawari, 895 AD. Kitab Al-Filaha al nabatiya Nabatian Agriculture, by Ibn Wahshiya, 9th century. Kitab Al-Saydala, a pharmaceutical encyclopedia by Al-Bayruni, who lived between 973 and 1048. All of these books popularized knowledge, indigenous knowledge on agriculture, and knowledge that also found its roots in older civilization. And this helped make the Arab Muslim world an agricultural powerhouse up until the 17th century when European colonialism started transforming and altering the patterns of agriculture in our region. The first cookbooks. Now let's talk about food. 
The book I'm holding in my hands in Arabic is called Kitab al tabikh Kitab, book, al tabikh cookery. This is one of the first cookbooks in the history of mankind. Of course, we do have cookbooks from Roman period. We do have some recipes as old as uh, Pharaonic Egypt or Mesopotamia or classical Greece, but this is one of the first complete cookbook that is produced to the, for the masses and not only for the elites. It was written in 10th century Baghdad, when back then Baghdad was the biggest city on earth. Its population was um, estimated around 1 million inhabitants by Ibn Sayyar al-Warraq. Warraq in Arabic means paper. So he comes from a dynasty of paper makers. I'm sorry. Is the most comprehensive work of its kind. This traditional cookbook with more than 600 recipes from the luxurious cuisine of classical Islam is also a rare guide to the culinary culture of that period. Uh, let me invite you to prepare a sandwich from a recipe of a sandwich from this book. I am inviting you to make something that we call Bazmaward. So, in uh, a, a lot of classical um, recipes from Baghdad, you might find names that are inspired from Arabic, from Persian, from Greek, from Aramaic. It was a very diverse civilization. This giant canapé or sandwich, so the recipe is that of the medieval sandwich, is inspired by uh, uh, pre-Islamic uh, uh, food culture and the Islamic food culture of Baghdad. The name comes from the Persian baz, banquet, and awurd, bringing. So the recipe. So if you want, take a screenshot of the slide. You need a flatbread, a lavash, a Mexican tortilla, or other thin flatbread. You need a whole chicken breast, roasted, boned, and chopped. You can, if you are either vegetarian or vegan, remove the chicken and replace it by something else. Two tablespoons of chopped walnuts, one and a half or two lemons, peeled, seeded, and also chopped. One tablespoon of minced fresh tarragon, one tablespoon of chopped mint, and two tablespoons of chopped basil. You mix all of this. I hope you took a screenshot of that. You spread the flatbread on work surface. You sprinkle evenly all over with the chicken, the walnuts, the chopped lemon, the tarragon, the mint, and the basil. You roll up, you cut into four slices, you warm in the oven before serving, and you serve as an appetizer. And here you go. You have a recipe from 10th century Baghdad, and you have one of the oldest recipes for sandwich in the world. So these dishes were actually um, eaten by the connoisseurs of Baghdad when it was the richest city in the world. Also, there are recipes from the, uh, from, uh, that are inspired by the personal tastes of the different caliphs, the uh, emperors like Al-Mahdi and Al-Mutawakkil and especially there are many recipes in the Middle East that are inspired by the wife of Harun al-Rashid called Buran. Centuries later, cookbooks and food in the Middle East would still carry recipes named after these very men, Haruniya, Ma'muniya, Mutawakkiliya, Ibrahimiya. So this is very important to know that it is still part of our indigenous culture. And a dish named, I'm sorry, for Mahmoud's wife, Buraniya, lives on today. And if it reflects how 9th century Baghdadi cuisine was rich and complex, and also, and this is very important, even though if the concept of vegan or vegetarian wasn't present in 10th century Baghdad, the book actually had a section on dishes that we would now consider as vegan or vegetarian. Also, this is very important. There is a section of dishes called muzawwarat. Well, muzawwar in Arabic means counterfeit. 
they would be dishes, but muzawwar in the in Arabic uh, culinary heritage is not a bad thing. It is everything you cook without using neither meat or dairy products or fish or eggs or so you only use or vegan or vegetarian products. These dishes in the Middle East are used, are eaten, are prepared by the local Christian communities during Lent. Lent in the Middle East, Christian Lent is 50 days. So for 50 days a year, the local Christians would only eat vegetarian and vegan dishes. And they were added to a cookbook written by Ibn, Ibn al-Waraq was a Muslim. And it was specifically noted in the book that these were dishes prepared by the Christians during the land period. And this reflects the diversity in Abbasid Baghdad. Another small thing that few actually know, this is a period where social etiquette, design, art was defined in the Arab Muslim world and not in Western Europe. There is a crucial historical figure that few people know about. His name is Ziryan. He's a sub-Saharan African musician, astronomer, fashion designer, and gastronome in the Muslim Arab world. So even if his ancestors came from sub-Saharan Africa, he was born as Abu al-Hassan Ali ibn Nafi in Iraq in 789. He was nicknamed Ziryab in traditional Arabic, in old Arabic. Ziryab means two things. He was nicknamed Ziryab because of his melodious voice and his dark complexion features, which people compared with the singing bird of black plumage, hence his nickname, the black bird. And this was a very good thing in uh, Abbasid Baghdad. This is an artistic rendering of him. Why are we talking about Ziryab? Ziryab was active in Baghdad and Cordoba in Andalusia, present day Spain, in the early 9th century. He is credited with introducing the Oud. Let me give you an idea of what the Oud is. Just one moment to actually uh, link the the oud is the traditional lute in the. This is his music. credited with introducing the Oud to uh, the, um, just let me, thank you. So not only he is credited with introducing the Oud to Andalusia, he is also credited with adding the fifth bass string to the Oud, an addition that completely changed the instrument. The oud is still a, a very important indigenous instrument in Arabic music. He also he is also credited in establishing the first conservatoire in the world in Cordoba and Andalusia. He is also credited in transforming social costumes and as seen in dresses and hairstyling. He basically developed the concept of fashion and of social etiquette. Like this, he spread the use of tablecloth, dining etiquette, and new recipes that he brought from Baghdad to Andalusia. And at the end, he introduced the concept of winter and summer dresses, setting exactly the date when each fashion is worn. He also added dresses of half season for between seasons. So I wanted to tell you about this very important historical figure unknown because of colonial narratives and Eurocentric uh, centric history. And he fits within this area, uh, this period where the Arab world was setting the, um, the tone. 
Section five, indigenous versus colonial agriculture, agriculture, the case of Lebanon. You, mom, uh, Lebanon in the, before 1920, didn't exist as a territorial state. It existed as a geographical concept, ruled by the different empires that were in the region. However, in 1861, and uh, the, uh, the um, uh, Mount Lebanon and the region was already under Ottoman rule since 1516, following violent sectarian uh, clashes, uh, the area that we call Mount Lebanon, so the mountainous core of present-day Lebanon, was transformed within the Ottoman Empire into an autonomous province that we call Mutasarrifia. In Ottoman, it's a province. And this was largely backed by French interests. Why were the French so interested? in this area. We are in the 19th century. This is the period of the industrial age of colonial expansion. And let's discover one. So between 1861 and 1814, Lebanon enjoyed self-rule and elected governing council, a local gendarmerie police force, a rapidly growing infrastructure of roads, school, waterworks, driving tourism. French political and economic influence, lower taxes than other region of the empire, exemption from conscription to the Ottoman army. This sounds as a very good situation. However, there is something that the narrative actually never sheds light on. Why were the French so interested in building roads, expanding the port of Beirut, and investing in Mount Lebanon? And why? During this period, there was a massive exodus of Lebanese from Mount Lebanon, a massive movement, movement where anywhere from 15 to 50% of villages and towns emptied out in Mount Lebanon. So why, if they had all of these privileges, why did they leave? The answer is in agriculture. Let's see how. The majority left for economic reasons. We can actually put this massive exodus as part of the global great migration of the 19th century, which saw the movement of millions leaving poor economic conditions in places such as the Ottoman Empire, Italy and Greece to countries in desperate need for labor like the US, Argentina and Brazil. But why? So the, the immigrants from the Eastern Mediterranean, the Swana region, left limited opportunities in their homeland for better possibilities somewhere else to make money and return home. However, they had better possibilities before that. So what happened for them to actually be faced in the 19th century, especially the second half, with limited possibilities? So the answer is here. In the case of Mount Lebanon, it was silk, cultivated and produced, produced in its mountains since the 17th century, that French industrialists sought for their factories back in Lyon and other cities. This was behind the massive immigration. How? This area, this autonomous Mount Lebanon, was primarily an enclave of mono production of silk at the service of the silk industry of Lyon. Sorry. So after millenniums of being an area with a, with a diverse economy, an area that was famous for producing olive oil, the olive tree is indigenous to the Middle East. And it is one of the trees that actually was very important in present day. Palestine, Lebanon, Syria, and Turkey. And this is why Zionism make of actually uprooting olive trees, one of the cornerstones of their agricultural economy. So what happened? How did Mount Lebanon lose its agricultural diversity? Of course, it was a production that was 
mainly directed towards uh, 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 local, uh, 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 the local needs, and there was not much exportation. However, they had everything they needed to eat. Why now they were only producing silk? So in the course of the 19th century, French industrialists who were interested in silk uh, kind of picked up on the demographical growth in Mount Lebanon and used this population as a labor force to produce silk. And as you know, to produce silk, you need to have everywhere and in large numbers mulberry trees. Why? Silkworms only eat mulberry leaves and silkworms eat a lot of mulberry leaves per day. A mulberry tree needs at least five years to grow and to be able to produce enough leaves to feed the silkworms. So encouraged by the industrialists who came and invested in Lebanon and by missionaries, especially Catholic missionaries, the peasants of Mount Lebanon started, were pushed by the economic context to actually uh, abandon their ancestral indigenous agriculture because it didn't actually produce uh, enough money when Lebanon was being opened to the global cash market. And they had to uproot their olive trees, their wheat fields, and replace them with mulberry trees. Estimates, some historians estimate that there were 40 million mulberry trees in a small region as small as Mount Lebanon. After a few decades of boom, the price of silk cocoons and thread stagnated and then fell in the 1890s. Sericulture before the collapse, the crash, far from being the leading, sericulture is the production of silk. Far from being the leading sector of the economy in Mount Lebanon, developed at the expenses of other sectors, especially subsistent agriculture and permaculture. This led to grave consequences. In a mountainous region where cultivated land amounted to no more than 4% of the total surface, thousands of the best plots were devoted to the culture of mulberry trees which came to cover some 45% of Mount Lebanon's cultivated surface, all at the service of the colonial economy of France. So as I said, sericulture had developed primarily at the expense of cereal culture. So this French colonial interest in sericulture destroyed the indigenous agriculture in Mount Lebanon. Also, there is a side as a very dark side to silk production. These are one of the few, uh, these are one of the many actually visuals and pictures that we have of the silk factories. Look closer who is working. Children were employed at the silk factory, mostly owned by French industrialists or local bourgeois linked to them. And what the narrative never, never says is that Catholic missionaries played a major role in recruiting the children as labor force, especially the orphans. And they made them work in horrible conditions in the silk factories. Also, women were employed at the silk factory. Catholic missionaries also played a major role in recruiting them. They were paid less and worked under the supervision of men, many of whom were ex-fighters in the sectarian violence in 1860. So they actually placed women under the supervision of thugs. And this actually changed the entire social and, 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 and uh, social context in Mount Lebanon. This system largely driven by colonial French interests that destroyed indigenous agriculture in Mount Lebanon brought new challenges. This new political regime in the Ottoman Empire and the new administrative system of an autonomous Mount Lebanon allowed free trade, which led to an influx of European goods into the Lebanese market. 
As a result, Mount Lebanon's economy shifted rapidly from an autarkic regime to actually opening to the global economy, which required the use of cash, where Lebanese relied on barter and exchange of goods. At that time, as I said, 40% of cultivated land was allocated to growing mulberry trees. This resulted in an export-driven monoculture. Imagine that after thousands of years of producing olive oil, cereal, fruits, sugar cane, even cotton in some parts of Lebanon, you only produce now silk at the service of French colonial interest. So this resulted in an export-driven monoculture and Mount Lebanon had to resort for the first time in its history to import in large, large quantities foodstuff. It did import foodstuff before that, of course, but it had the ability to import that, such as wheat in a period of demographic expansion and heavy debts. About 45% of Mount Lebanon's population is said to have emigrated between 1860 and 1914. Mount Lebanon's population in 1913 is estimated to have been half a million, practically half a million. And this is how the first Lebanese diaspora was born, because of that, because of colonial French interest and investment disrupted indigenous agricultural patterns in Mount Lebanon. And it resulted in the massive exodus of 35 or 45 percent of the population between 1870 and 1914. It was also one of the main factors behind the famine that killed 40% of Lebanon's population during World War I because they didn't have enough cereal and they didn't have access to cereals because of the sericulture driven, driven economy. I'm sorry, the case of Lebanon is very important to understand how colonialism and economy, colonial economy, disrupted indigenous and traditional production patterns, and even changed the nature, uh, changed the nature of agricultural production in the lands where they first had economic influence, such as Mount Lebanon, and later on lands that were placed directly under colonial rule. And this contributed to these indigenous population to losing their food sovereignty. And losing your food sovereignty is one of the tools of colonialism. Conclusion. Orientalism, colonialism, and Zionism, so three major uh, uh, political and cultural movements that were born in the 19th century and that we still find in the 21st century, especially neocolonialism and Zionism, Orientalism to a lesser extent, argue that Arabs and people of the Swana are hostile to agriculture. They argue that Swana, Mena, the Middle East were Bedouins and never developed agriculture. This narrative, that these people don't have an indigenous agriculture. This is very important. One of the main narratives of colonialism stated that people of the Swana or the Menna or the Middle East didn't have indigenous agriculture. And it was used to justify colonialism and the takeover of land, such as in Palestine, where Zionism always used the narrative that Palestinians weren't farmers, whether the historical reality is that the absolute majority of Palestinians were farmers. This is the time to refute and counter this narrative. We belong to an area that witnessed the birth of agriculture and pastoralism and the domestication of crops and animals that are crucial to our sovereignty. We are the heirs of 12,000 years of agricultural know-how. We are not beginners. We are the masters in that. We are the caretakers of eight founder crops, some of which are essential to the global diet and global economy. We are the depository of a green medieval revolution. We possess 
all the elements of food sovereignty. It is time to end the legacy of colonialism and counter neocolonialism, reclaim our indig indigenous know-how and agriculture and go back to our green roots. Thank you. Absolutely. What ways can we revive indigenous agriculture in our own communities? This is this is excellent, actually. I love Maybe this. Maybe Adib uh, Dada needs to be here. Yes, of course. So first and foremost, you need proper historical, agronomical research to know what was planted traditionally. Because our ancestors actually studied the climate, the soil, and understood what kind of crop should be planted where. So first, research. Then see how it can be modernized. Going back to indigenous agriculture doesn't mean that we will go back to production patterns, uh, antique, antique or medieval production pattern. It means that we can take this historical component and make it part of our modern lives. The first thing we have to do is identify what was planted, how it was planted, and in what context. Absolutely. What can we do about this ourselves? Is there an organization working on Arab food sovereignty or bringing back indigenous uh, agricultural practices that we can support? Well, there isn't one organization, but there are many grassroots initiatives and NGOs that are actually doing a very nice work. Like there is, if I may, Celine mention uh, Nation Station in Beirut, mm. who are working- Who are on, supporting. Yes, who Slow Factory is supporting, who are actually working on documenting indigenous crops and reintroducing indigenous culinary culture and making it accessible in a very modern and effective way in the middle of the city. They have weekly, I think, talks where they introduce people to our indigenous crops. Would you please share more context and background on the term Bedouin and Bedouin culture and how exactly it has been used as a colonial justification? Of course, so Bedouin is just one of the local words in Arabic, Badu, that we're taking into English and French, to denote nomadism. It's a way of life where you actually are not settled in one location, but you move according to the seasons, and you are looking for grazing lands for uh, your cattle, because your main uh, economic activity is pastoralism, and you're looking for water. Bedouins were the minority historically in, in the Middle East, especially when we're talking about the Muslim period. The majority of the inhabitants of the Muslim League uh, were either urban-based, we, we are an urban civilization, or farmers. Colonialism said that this area was very prosperous under Roman times, because the Romans, according to Eurocentric Western narratives, are Westerners, uh, 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 Arab Muslim expansion brought the demise of agriculture because the Arabs were Bedouins and they were hostile to agriculture. And we as colonials, we're coming back with civilization and with agriculture. But so this is how they instrumentalized the term and that became um, a synonym with everything that is negative. Up until now, many actually Lebanese who were brought up by the missionaries think that they are the opposite of Bedouins. But we are not, I know. And that is something key that we have to remind our population, our people, because as I say, and, and I, 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 I'm studying that a lot, that um, the generations that live under French mandate are the lost generations, sadly. They are the ones who have lost their pride in who they are, at least. And that is already a big loss, uh, not to count the um, cultural erasure that they've been under. That is why some of our names, like you and me, Charles and Céline, are French and Céline. name and English names, and they are not uh, traditional to our heritage. And this is, we live, we are the embodiment of cultural erasure. We are the embodiment and, the, and basically we live a life against this cultural erasure. And that is why our work is so deeply, deeply tied to our history and to our heritage. Uh, Charles, do you want to comment on that very quickly? 
I, I fully agree, I fully agree. It is actually, we are the product of this generation that uh, experienced cultural erasion. And I need to add something that under French mandate or British mandate in the Middle East, claiming attachment to your cultural heritage was seen as a derogatory, and I'm sorry, I can't pronounce it because- Derogative. <laughs> derogative activity. And actually this pushed many actually to hide their uh, traditional culture because they couldn't get anywhere in the colonial hierarchy if they would claim their traditional dress. This is why we are dressed as Westerners. This is why we have names as Western. This, this is why our culinary uh, culture is also heavily influenced by Western cuisine, which is horrible because, uh, not because the food is horrible, not judging the food, because you lose your sovereignty. And also it's as healthy for our own bodies, our own DNA. There are some studies that would say that's why we are intolerant to certain things for people yes. that are coming from our region. Um, I would like to add uh, uh, that there is a class that I taught that's called fashion and colonialism as part of open EDU. And I talk exactly about that. And I mention why my name is Celine. And in fact, it's one of the topics in my book uh, that I'm uh, writing slowly, but surely but slow and steady wins the race. Is there, if there was pushback to the French, what did it look like during this era? Uh, do you mean if there was a refusal of French Yes, because in the past class yes. we spoke about refusal. How did refusal uh, uh, manage, like, how did refusal manifest itself during that time? Of course, this is a very, very interesting question. Refusal was mainly political and there are many uprisings against mandate rule. Also, you have mainly the uprisings were driven by the farmers who refused to see their lands transformed to an agricultural pattern that would serve economic uh, interest of the colonial power. However, these present uprising were violently crushed. So what the narrative doesn't tell us is that the French first occupied the region in 1918 after the fall of the Ottoman Empire, then in 1920, and in 1925, they had to send their army once again to end a massive uprising between Lebanon and Syria and reconquer. So there were refusal, uh, 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 this is politically speaking, and there were some initiatives by local intellectuals who started writing about our agriculture, our heritage, and trying to be as active. However, the influence, the impact was limited. Why? Because the main intellectual institutions back then were in the hands of the colonial hierarchy or in the hands of the missionaries who were essential tools in the colonial project or the local elites who cooperated with the colonial uh, system. Thank you so much. Um, okay. It seems the whole mindset of colonialism is to divide us based on class, race, color, sex, and any other factors so that we don't see what the real issue is. All over the world, this pattern of disruption of indigenous species of plants so that we become dependent on government food supply or loss of food sovereignty is made to seem like a good thing because such large quantities in production feeds the world. But at what cost to sovereign nations worldwide? But at what cost to sovereign nations worldwide? I don't know if it's an actual question, more like a comment, but it is a beautiful comment. And it is true. It is about division. It yes, it's about division. <laughs> um, can you please talk about how modern day wars in the region have contributed to the destruction of agriculture? And here they say Basra and Fao, South Era, for example. So, of course, so um, keep in mind that the Middle East region has been in a state of constant war for over a century. And a state of constant war puts a strain on the agricultural system because who are the fighters? They are the farmers usually. So two, the fighting is actually farming and agriculture is part of the fighting area, especially in Palestine where Zionism aims at destroying Palestinian agricultural traditions and lands to conquer and colonize more and more. 
Fao and Basra. Basra was one of the most prosperous agricultural urban centers. It was a, a center of agricultural uh, management and production. It was this largely um, destroyed during the Iraq-Iran war when the system of the marshlands, the beautiful marshlands in southern Iraq, were heavily affected by that war and were heavily affected by the dictatorship of Saddam Hussein, where he actually pushed for the, um, the, the, he wanted to dry the marshland so he can control the population that was in constant uprising. So of course, war uh, in Lebanon, uh, war and rural exodus emptied the agricultural lands. So this is one of the reasons also why we lost our food sovereignty because we didn't, we don't have enough labor force to work the land because of the economic system and the ongoing wars. Hala, last question, last but not least, hummus. First of all, say it. Say, how do we pronounce hummus? Hummus. Hummus, hummus. is an Arabic word. <laughs> <laughs> Arabic word, tudda. Tudda is period in English. Um, Hamas has been gentrified. Hamas has been taken out of context. Tell us a little bit about Hamas and its political uh, um, co-opting, yani politically. Yes. So we are, you need to keep in mind that hummus should be divided into two. First, chickpeas are a, a very important ingredient in Middle Eastern food. And by Middle Eastern food is every food except the Israeli food. It's not Middle Eastern, it's colonial food. Israel is a very recent state. We are thousands of years old. They are less than a century old. So how can they- 70 claim, years in total. How they can they claim food that is not there. So hummus as chickpeas is a very important component of the culinary heritage of the Swan region and especially the Arab world. To the hummus that is very popular in the West that is used as a dip and is, as Celine said, is gentrified, is actually a dish. It's a very popular dish in the Arab world. It is not gentrified, it is not a, 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 a dip, and it's a dish you would find practically every day, everywhere in Lebanon, Syria, Palestine, Jordan, Egypt, uh, even parts of I Iraq. It's a very ancient dish that has many varieties, all developed in the region, and especially developed in the Arab Muslim world. The current last, let's say, recipe, that took 800 years in evolution is what we call hummus bithine. It's you actually boil chickpeas, you crush them into a paste, and you add lemon juice and tahina to create this paste. Tahini in the English version. Tahini. It's very important to tahini. keep in mind that it's popular food. It's not gentrified food. <laughs> And uh, people asked if, because we said that when you were starting to talk about hummus, I started to say it's not a dip. It's a, and then people were like, well, it's not, if it's not a dip, what is it? And I said, it's a dish. So tell us a little bit, because in the book that you mentioned, hummus as a dish is one of the first recipes and that they trace it back to? Well, we can trace back the different recipes of hummus to either Pharaonic Egypt or uh, Mesopotamia. So before Christ, uh, where people were using chickpeas. But the actual uh, uh, hummus recipe that we have today was elaborated between the 10th and the 12th century between Baghdad, uh, Damascus, Beirut, and Cairo. It had uh, 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 the, 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 the tradition recipes give you two levels of hummus. The popular hummus, that is, hummus, tahina, and the, the upper class hummus, where you would add Aleppo pistachios to it. Aleppo pistachios, yes. And it, was, it is always eaten with our khubz. It's not called pita, it's flatbread, it's khubz. Khubz, um, yes. And you, you, you mentioned that bread uh, is uh, you know one of the most ancient. I think you mentioned that before the class, but just yes. speak a little bit about bread and the bread that I also uh, mentioned briefly that in the class. So because uh, wheat was one of the first domesticated crops in the Middle East, and because gradually Neolithic humans discovered that by uh, crushing 
the grains, you would get a, a flour. And if you mix the flour with water and uh, uh, um, actually put it in what we call now an oven, you would get bread. Bread was one of the first foods that were uh, elaborated by our ancestors. And it was elaborated in the Middle East. And what archeology span tells us that the ovens that we still have in many rural areas in the Middle East that we call tanur, it's, it's like a, a, a wood oven. Uh, it's like the oven where you would make your pizza, uh, but it's made out of adobe or clay is still the same. Practically the design and the shape didn't change over 12,000 years. Neither did the shape of the bread. So in any area of the Middle East, by eating either uh, bread that we call tanur, the one that is made in this traditional oven, or a bread that we make on an iron concave element that we call saj, you are actually eating a bread that is thousands of years old. And it is a crucial element in our diet. Because traditionally in the Middle East, we only used forks, and spoons, uh, uh, we used forks rarely, we used spoons. So to eat, we used the bread to actually take the food. And, and we ate with consume. our hands, that's, that's one of the last Our things. hands and traditionally in the Middle East, you would only eat with your right hand as a sign of blessing. And then because so you would wipe your hand, you would wipe your ass in the left hand, by the way. That's why it, yeah. they had to differentiate. <laughs> um, but yes, now on that note, I think this is amazing. Thank you so much, Charles. Thank we you, definitely Celine. need to make another class and to dive deeper into the loss of that indigeneity. Of course, we will be able to dive deeper into the wars, into the situation that is happening even yes. currently in Lebanon. And um and you know, just thank you so much. This class thank made you. me hungry. I'm going to go try the, the recipe. Uh, yes, but we'll substitute chicken with lentils because I don't eat. It works. And it uh, works. I'm pretty sure also most of the time it was. Uh, or actually, so you can substitute hummus. with hummus, it goes well with spinach. Yes, hummus, definitely. And thank you so much. I cannot wait to be able to travel with you to Lebanon. I mean, to go see. I love you. And I think my whole team wants to come with me on an archaeological trip with you and a historical trip. And I love following you because you are able uh, in, to go to these places. Um, even recently, because of the sh fuel shortage, you had like one trip that I was so happy you did. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> and um, wow. maybe there's one last question. What are your thoughts on guns, germs, and steel, the fates of human societies by Jared Diamond? Actually, it's a very good book. I actually do love this uh, theory that uh, Jared Diamond proposed, and it helps you understand more how colonialism worked in our areas or in Latin America. It's a book that I highly advise. And there is also the same title is the title of a documentary that Jared Diamond did. So for people who uh, uh, want fast access to data, they can do that through the documentary. Amazing. Let's definitely add that book when you are sharing your resources. Yes. Please share yes. all the resources that you can get. I'm so happy to be also a Slow Factory fellow. Thank you for all the team. And hopefully we'll be able to talk soon about uh, our region and our beautiful history. Inshallah, we can travel and have a group travel soon. Inshallah, inshallah, inshallah. Thank you so and much, everyone. Have a beautiful weekend. Good day. Good, good evening to you. And... Thank you, thank you, thank you. And try yeah. the medieval sandwich from Baghdad. Allah, I will thank try you for right me. now, right now. Right. Thank you so much. Allah, Bye. Salam. Bye. Bye. Bye.